I work in a field that requires a lot of travel, a lot of travel. I'm on the road at least a couple of weeks every month and spend more time in airports or hotels than at home in my own bed. Fortunately, I'm not a family man. He was married twice and divorced twice. The first marriage ended when I returned home at 11 a.m. with a stomach flu to find Evelyn with her lover in our living room. The second time it was my fault. I just couldn't trust after what Evelyn did and never fully committed to Joanna. My infidelities ultimately led to divorce. There were no children in either the first or second marriage. So life is lonely, but at least when I travel I meet new people. I've had an awful lot of conversations in airport bars, and this was one of the most memorable. It all started out typical. The guy sat down next to me on the bar stool and ordered a beer. We nodded to each other, exchanged a few ironic remarks about the weather and the joys of travel. We both had a couple of hours to kill, and the conversation slowed down into a mildly interesting tale. We talked about business travel for a while good and bad airlines, good and terrible cities, and then baseball. He was an Astros fan, but he didn't have much to brag about. I told him that I had seen Jeff Bagwell play when he was still in the minors in the Boston Red Sox system. We talked about how many airports we visited, how many times we've exchanged stories with strangers over the years, an idle conversation that looked like it might end. But there was no need for me to rush, there were still two hours left before my flight. Can I ask you something, he said. Of course, I replied. Recently, a guy told me a story and asked me what the moral was. Since then, I've been thinking about it and still can't decide. Do you want to listen to it? Why not, I said. This is a story about a woman named Mary, he said and began his story. Maria's life in her youth was shaped by one main, painful fact. Her mother was a woman of easy virtue. Mary's mother, Rosie, was a beautiful and charming woman, cheerful and full of life kind and generous, a woman who had many friends. But she loved sex very much, and when she realized that her husband could not give her as much as she wanted, she did not hesitate to find other lovers who could satisfy what she was missing at home. Maria's father caught his wife cheating three times. Remarkably, after the first two, she dissuaded him from divorcing her. But the third time, after he entered the bedroom and found her with her lover, he kicked her out of the house. Maria was only seven years old, and from then on, she and her two older brothers shuttled between divorced parents, one in Miami, the other in Tampa, constantly feeling insecure and unwanted. Maria loved her mother, but absolutely hated what Rosie had done, destroying a previously happy family, and she decided that she would never allow something like that to happen to her. Despite all the usual temptations, requests, and pleas of her boyfriends, Maria swore that her first man would be her husband, which she did. At age 22, fresh out of the University of Miami, Maria went to work as a paralegal for a small law firm in Key West. Four months later, she was invited to dinner by a young city accountant, 28-year-old Alexander Malcolm Winters, an intelligent and articulate man who was about to become a partner in the company for which he worked. They dated for over a year, and although Maria grew very fond of Alex, she resisted his attempts to make love before marriage, as she had resisted all the attempts of his predecessors. It turned out to be a happy marriage. Alex was a hard-working and ambitious man and succeeded in his firm. He was also completely devoted to Mary, considering himself lucky to have such a beautiful and loving wife. When he wasn't working long hours, he served Maria, bringing her coffee in the morning making breakfast on the weekends while she slept late, picking up dry cleaning, and running other errands when he could. In the same way, Maria loved and appreciated Alex. Her father wasn't a man who did much around the house, even in the happy days before the divorce, and she was grateful for Alex's efforts. Her husband seemed willing to provide them both with a good life, safety, and comfort, and she did everything she could to support him. They decided to wait before having children, so Maria took the pill and their sex life could be completely spontaneous. She discovered that she loved sex in fact, she was a little scared by how much she loved it. 
Maria enjoyed everything new that her husband, who had several previous girlfriends, taught her in bed. Mr. and Mrs. Winters often had sex, both at his and her instigations, and derived great pleasure from it. But there was one fly in the ointment, one problem that prevented everything from being perfect, Alex's endurance. Alex felt terrible about disappointing his wife, even though Maria lovingly assured him that it didn't matter that she enjoyed their sex life together. They worked on the problem, studying literature on sex and even consulting with a family therapist, but they never solved it. Despite this difficulty, one should not think that Alex and Maria were estranged from each other. They loved each other deeply and were comfortable enough together to talk freely about the problem and how to solve it. Therefore, no one could say that their sex life was bad, and Maria would never say such a thing. In fact, as she and her best friend Susan idly gossiped about their lives, including their sex lives, Maria made her life sound amazing. She could convince herself that she was not like her mother, who was so obsessed with the need for more and better sex that she ruined her life and the life of her family. Be that as it may, something happened that disrupted her safe and happy existence. That someone was Alex's younger brother, Kenny. When Maria married Alex, she had not yet met Kenny, who was 23, unemployed and hanging around the West Coast, staying with his high school friends. But a couple of years later, he moved to Key West and got a job on a small sport fishing boat that catered to wealthy tourists. For the first three weeks of his stay in the city, until he found an apartment, Kenny stayed with Alex and Maria. Alex loved his little brother, treated him with care and tenderness, and seemed to be blind to his shortcomings. But Maria noticed them all. Kenny was immature, selfish, and a little rude. He acted completely unaware of the fact that his presence might disrupt the order of his brother's house or embarrass Mary. Kenny walked around in his boxers, drank a lot of beer, stayed up late with the TV on too loud, and didn't even lift a finger to wash the dishes, clean up after himself, or do anything that a half-conscious guest could possibly do. A couple of weeks later, Maria complained to Alex who in turn asked Kenny to at least stop throwing dirty laundry on the floor. But it didn't make things any better, and Maria was secretly glad when Kenny moved out. What she didn't admit, even to herself, was that part of the reason Kenny annoyed her was because she found him sexy. She didn't like him, didn't enjoy his company, and resented the loss of privacy, but often looked at his body with great interest. He was about the same height as Alex. But while her accountant husband had gotten a little soft from long hours at his desk, Kenny had the tan and strong muscles that came with living outdoors on a fishing boat. Alex continued to regularly invite his brother to dinner, so Maria could not avoid him completely. From time to time the two men would stay up late together, drinking beer and laughing about stories or people they remembered from their childhood. Alex had never been much of a drunk himself. But when he and his brother set out, they would often get drunk late into the night, and one or both would pass out before reaching bed. On one of these evenings, Maria herself drank several bottles of beer before going to bed around 11 hours p.m., much more drunk than she usually allowed herself to be. Too drunk to do the dishes or brush her teeth, Maria threw her clothes on the chair next to the bed, pulled on her nightgown, and fell asleep almost instantly. She later made love to Ken, thinking he was her husband Alex. You son of a bitch. You bastard. What the hell are you doing in bed with me? You know I didn't consent, right? Alex will fucking kill you. Easy now, Maria, he replied, not seeming particularly concerned. Are you sure you want your loving husband to know everything about what we did? I didn't know it was you. I thought it was Alex. I know you thought it was your husband, I even stopped in the bathroom to put on some of his cologne. But do you really think Alex will believe you? It's better to just keep this between you and me, Maria. Having said this, Kenny calmly rose from the bed and began to gather his clothes. Still furious, Maria said nothing, her mind reeling. She didn't want to admit it to herself, but Kenny was right. Telling Alex what his brother had done would be a risky proposition. At best, her husband will believe her, 
and this will mean the final end of all contact between the brothers, or even a real fight. But what if he doesn't believe her? What if Kenny convinced Alex that she liked it, that she was an active participant, that she knew Kenny was in bed with her all along? She doubted Alex would fully believe it. But would he still have doubts about her? Did she dare take such a risk? Without another word, her face tense with anger and disappointment, Maria watched as Kenny left the room, winking happily at her, and headed to the guest bedroom, where he often stayed when he and Alex spent their evenings drinking. To feel so damn good, and then to be so shocked and angry, to feel so helpless, was a lot for Maria to go through in one evening. After this, Maria and Kenny found themselves in a difficult standoff, at least for her. She had never been so angry in her life, never felt so humiliated in her life. But the more she thought about it, the less chance she had of telling her husband what Kenny had done and still being married the risk was too great that Kenny's version would make Alex so furious that he would leave her, or will never trust her again, and every day it became more and more impossible to talk about it with Alex. After about a week, she realized with horror that she would have to live with her secret. All she could really do was try to avoid Kenny. She started leaving the house whenever he came, to go shopping or visit a friend. She did anything to avoid meeting him. When Alex asked why she didn't stay close to him and Kenny, she replied, Because you two drink too much, and then Kenny gets rude, and I don't like being around him. She didn't dare go any further than that. Alex tried a couple of times to heal the rift between his brother and his wife. One day he invited the three of them to a fancy restaurant to celebrate his promotion. The food was great, but the evening was not a great experience. Kenny was relaxed and cheerful and charmingly flirted with his sister-in-law, but Maria was visibly stressed and unhappy. She only spoke when asked a direct question, even seemed to flinch when Kenny complimented her and never felt comfortable enough to enjoy the evening. After that, Alex almost let it go. He continued to hang out with Kenny, but they went to Kenny's apartment or spent the evening at a bar more and more often. When they met at Alex's house, Maria kept finding reasons not to be there. In the meantime, however, Maria couldn't stop thinking about Kenny and what sex with him was like. It would be a great exaggeration to say that this disappointment constantly bothered her it did not. Both her love for Alex and the pleasure of their active sex life were a source of joy and satisfaction for her. But she never completely forgot what it was like with Kenny. What happened next can be blamed on fate, or perhaps on God's incomprehensible sense of humor. After years of working on someone else's boat, Kenny had saved enough money for a down payment. He started. Kenny fishing cruises, taking groups of two, three tourists out for a sunny day, a nice lunch with plenty of beer, and some relaxing fishing. In the third week of this new venture, while Kenny was still struggling to make a name for himself and attract enough clients to begin paying off a large loan he had taken out on his boat, his apartment building burned to the ground. A water heater in the basement overheated, several cardboard boxes caught fire, and the entire building exploded, stranding Kenny and nine other tenants on the street. Kenny's homeowner's insurance covered his belongings, but he suddenly had nowhere to live. Naturally, Alex invited him to temporarily move in with him and Maria. You can save a couple of months on rent, take the time to find a new place, and in the meantime, the money saved can be used for a loan on a boat, it will be perfect. Kenny was grateful and said so more than once. Maria was horrified, but knew that this was not a matter in which she could refuse her husband. So Kenny was back in her life and in her home. Loud TV, rude remarks, dirty dishes and dirty clothes all over the house. But now it was many times worse because of what happened between them two years earlier. She just didn't like having Kenny around, and she hated admitting the fact that she was still attracted to him. At first, Kenny tried his best to be polite to Maria. He was still a slob, but he didn't mock her or stalk her. He didn't want to do anything that would lead to his brother throwing him out. But after a few weeks, he began to enjoy walking around the house only partially dressed when Maria was at home and Alex was at work. 
This often happened in the mornings because Alex left at 7.30 and Maria only had to go to work at 8.45. Sometimes he left the guest room for the kitchen wearing only his underpants. Sometimes she noticed his chest and arms, muscular and tanned from physical work in the fresh air. Everything came to a head when Alex went on a four-day business trip to San Francisco. It was his turn to represent the company at a professional meeting. Maria wanted to go with him, desperate not to be alone in the house with Kenny. But Alex reminded her that they were saving money for a trip to Greece next winter, and he was adamant about not spending more than $1 to $500 on her joining him for such a short time. On Sunday evening, the day Alex left, Maria returned from dropping him off at the airport to find Kenny sitting on the couch in his underpants, smiling at her. She looked at him, blushed, and snapped at him furiously. Look, Kenny, just because Alex left doesn't mean you and I are going to do anything. It happened once once, and it happened because I was drunk and didn't realize it was you. Now just stay away from me. Is it clear? But Kenny just smiled lazily at her and said, Sure, Maria, just relax, okay? And she shuddered, knowing that she was in the same danger because of her own feelings. That night, she wedged a chair under the knob of her bedroom door, so Kenny couldn't come in while she was sleeping. Around midnight, Kenny finally tried to enter. He walked quietly to the door, pushing it carefully until he realized it was barricaded. The next night, Mary's chair was in the same place. On Tuesday morning, Maria sleepily stood in the kitchen, preparing herself coffee and breakfast. She took a day off from work to run a few errands and enjoyed having the house to herself since Kenny usually left by 8 a.m. to get the boat ready for the day's cruise. Damn it, why couldn't Alex come home? She had two more days to get over it. Briefly, she was thinking about taking an impromptu trip to Miami to visit her mother for a couple of days. She then heard a noise in the hallway and turned around to see Kenny standing in the kitchen, grinning at her, wearing only boxers. With her back to him, she said, It's almost nine. Why are you still here? The trip was canceled today. The guy called me yesterday. He and his friend both got sick. They've done it again. At one else in Mary. I left the house to go to work. She gave up. The idea of visiting her. Mother and returned home at the usual time. Maria and Kenny spent that night and the next together. She and Kenny met alone at least once a week, sometimes more often, even after Kenny moved back into his own place. Of course, they tried their best to hide their affair from Alex, each for their own reasons. Maria, in particular, was almost fanatical about this. Naturally, they took the obvious precautions, waiting for Alex to leave the house, meeting mostly at Kenny's apartment in case Alex ever returned home unexpectedly, and so on. Maria kept her regular brands of soap and shampoo at Kenny's and took a thorough shower and perfume before heading to Alex's house. She even insisted that Kenny wear the same cologne as Alex. In her mind, she went over all the details of her sex life with Alex, she did everything possible to keep everything the same. There was no decline in sex life, but there was no sharp increase either, so that he would not think that the changes occurred due to feelings of guilt and could not suspect her of cheating. And it worked. Alex never understood what she was up to. Gradually, he began to realize that sex had become less important to Maria, but he attributed this to the inevitable familiarity and sense of routine that comes with marriage after a few years. Otherwise, she was as loving and devoted as ever. They were a happy, loving couple, and Alex continued to feel lucky. Kenny, like Maria, really enjoyed their relationship, but he wanted more. One day it occurred to him how he could get it. Kenny had a slow-witted assistant named Sam, a blonde man in his early 20s, who did various jobs on the boat, helping tourists with fishing gear, pointing out points of interest, and serving lunches that Kenny supplied to his clients. Sam quit in early June of that year to return to Arkansas and help his ailing father run the family farm, and it occurred to Kenny that Maria would be an excellent replacement. She was much smarter than Sam, 
not to mention very attractive. The sight of her bouncing around the deck in a tiny bikini, smiling and flirting with customers, could only help business. And best of all, each cruise had at least an hour or so where the clients were so busy fishing that they didn't require any attention at all from Kenny and his assistant. Kenny decided that he and Maria could spend some time together below deck without anyone noticing. Kenny being Kenny, he was the first to approach Alex about this. He told him that he really needed help and that Maria would earn almost double what she was making in her boring job as a paralegal. Plus, there was fresh air, the joy of being outdoors, and it would be so nice for him to have his daughter-in-law around. Alex noticed that Maria wasn't avoiding Kenny as much anymore, that they actually seemed to be friends, and he liked that. He thought about it for a few days, then told Maria about Kenny's proposal and convinced her to accept it. Maria was at first more frightened than happy about this proposal. For nearly eight months, the new arrangement worked to everyone's satisfaction. Maria enjoyed working outdoors in the sunshine and enjoyed wearing bikinis, which attracted the gaze of the pale-faced, mostly middle-aged male tourists who were Kenny's main clients. Their occasional whistles or theatrical sighs of appreciation were a happy part of her day. The work she had to do was easy, at least every other day, he and Kenny had an hour to be alone while clients happily handed bait to the wily fish off Key West. The only problem, from Maria's point of view, was that it was becoming increasingly difficult to be interested in sex with Alex in the evenings. One day, Alex's boss asked him to invite a new client to lunch, Roger Vinson, who was moving his furniture company's four-person office staff to Key West. The factory remained in North Carolina. Vinson was a cheerful and talkative guy, and Alex enjoyed his company. Over lunch, Vinson told entertaining stories about all the good times he had already had in his few short weeks in Key West. Last Thursday, a buddy and I went fishing on one of those day fishing trips run by a guy named Kenny or something like that. Damn, that was great. We fought a couple of tarpans all day and almost caught one that needed to be caught. Seven feet long. Alex smiled, imagining that the fish was probably about three feet long. He was going to intervene and say, What a coincidence. Looks like you must have been on my brother's boat, as Vinson continued his story. We had a great lunch, and the girl who worked on board to serve us was something special. Damn, she was wearing that little red bikini. She was beautiful. I immediately understood why Kenny kept her with him. And in the afternoon, I realized that I had guessed correctly. I got up to get another beer from the fridge next to the stairs and heard what they were doing downstairs. Alex forced himself to sit still, telling his face to remain calm. He asked, What did this girl look like? I think maybe I know what boat you mean. Oh, she was quite small, about 5 FT4 in with nice breasts, not too big. She had a beautiful face and jet black hair that reached several inches to her shoulders. Yes, it was Maria. The description was perfect, except that Alex didn't think he'd ever seen her tiny red bikini. In a slightly strained voice, he said to Roger, I think it's a different boat. It's not like any I know. Alex experienced the longest and most painful day of his life. It was very obvious what was happening, which had apparently been happening for at least several months. Almost the only thing that interested him was whether his brother slept with Maria, even when he offered her a job. He had no doubt about how this would end, but Alex was too methodical a man to act without being completely sure. He called Dan Silverman, an old college friend who lived in Wisconsin, and invited him to Key West to help with the project. Here's the situation, Dan, Alex told him. I was asked to look into the affairs of this fishing boat run by a guy named Kenny Winters. He takes tourists on day trips, feeds them lunch, and lets them try to catch a few big fish. Anyway, there are rumors that something wrong is going on. Would you like a short, all-expenses-paid trip to Key West and a chance to go fishing? Dan was more than willing, and they planned a trip for the following week. Dan and Noah, a friend from Wisconsin, stayed at the hotel for a couple of nights, booked two days on Kenny's boat, 
and then reported back to Alex about everything they had noticed. Alex's company was supposed to cover all their expenses, but in reality Alex planned to pay the bills himself. Alex deliberately refrained from saying a word to Dan about Maria, hoping against hope that Roger Vinson was wrong and that his wife was not the cheater she now appeared to be. But his hope faded minutes after he joined Dan and his friend for dinner at the hotel, the evening after their second day on the boat. We had a great time, Alex, thanks to your company, Dan infused, grinning and showing off his bright red tan. No one nodded with equal happiness. But I can't say I picked up any leads, I mean, not really. No traces of illegal substances, contraband or anything else, no contact with other boats. No side errands or suspicious packages. This guy Kenny is sleeping with his assistant, but I doubt that's what your firm is interested in. Alex felt cold. Taking a slow, deep breath, he said, No, but tell me about it anyway. Is there a girl with him on the boat? Yes, the little black-haired one has a fantastic figure, and her swimsuit really shows it off. They came into the hut both afternoons while we were fishing, and we could hear they were engaged in. That's for sure, Alex said, feigning amusement. Are you sure they weren't just watching an adult movie or something? No, Dan said. Yesterday I just had to take a leak. I could have climbed down from the back of the boat, but I was curious, you know, so I went down the stairs kind of quietly. There was an open porthole in the head, and this was reflected in the cabin porthole. Alex once again used all his self-control. He calmly asked, Do you think there's definitely nothing prohibited going on here? Did Kenny offer you a girlfriend or something? Dan and Noah looked at each other, then shook their heads. Dan replied, No, nothing like that. We might be tempted to tell the truth, but she seemed to be just his girlfriend, or at least his friend. Alex felt about as well as one would expect about the way any loving husband might feel upon learning that his entire marriage, his entire life, had just been blown up in his face. His loving wife is a cheater, his brother is dishonest, a traitor, a son of a bitch. Thirteen days passed from the time Alex first heard Roger Vinson's story until Dan Silverman's stunning confirmation of the story. Meanwhile, Alex used all his strength to maintain the appearance of calm affection for Maria. Alex also used the 13 days to make some other preparations. Although he hoped against hope, deep down he knew what the outcome of Dan's investigation would be and he was ready to take action. Alex was an accountant he knew a lot about money, how to move it and how to hide it. He took out a home equity loan for the amount he could get for their home about $600,000. He then drained all but a few hundred dollars from his and Maria's accounts, added it to the equity money, and transferred it to and from numbered accounts in the Cayman Islands several times using fictitious names he created in his accounting. He also came to Fort Lauderdale one day, consulted a local lawyer, and appeared before a judge to change his name. In theory, such name changes should have been recorded in a searchable database, but Alex knew that often no one did. He ordered two credit cards in his new name and sent them to his lawyer's office in Fort Lauderdale for safekeeping. The next day, after dinner with Dan and his friend, Alex left work at noon and went home to pack his things. When Maria walked through the door around 6.30, everything he wanted to take with him was in the trunk of his car, and Alex was sitting on a chair in the living room, waiting for her arrival. He silently led her to the sofa and, holding her by the elbow, forced her to sit down. He then leaned down and brought his face inches closer to hers. Just sit here and be quiet, Maria. If you get up from this couch or open your mouth again, you will regret it. He didn't raise his voice, but his cold rage frightened her. Alex took out his cell phone and dialed the number. Hey dude, what's up? he asked cheerfully. Did you have good company today? Big dump trucks, he laughed. Listen, Maria and I are going to have dinner and go to the movies I'll treat you. Come on, join us. No, don't bother dressing up. Just let's meet. Okay, see you soon. Alex hung up. He sat down on the chair opposite Maria and waited, 
not looking at her or anything else. She was too scared to speak. About ten minutes later, they heard footsteps on the porch. Alex looked at Maria. Not a word, not a single word, he hissed at her, walking over and standing behind the door. Hey guys, I... Kenny began as he walked through the door. Then he stopped, looking uncertainty at Maria's frightened face on the other side of the room. Alex hit Kenny. Without looking back, Alex walked out the front door. A few moments later, the sound of a car starting and driving away was heard. My neighbor at the bar fell silent and took a long sip of beer, looking straight ahead, expressionless. Did she ever see Alex again? He nodded slowly, looking at me briefly. Only once, after about four months or so. She came home one afternoon to find him sitting on the couch in her apartment. She lost her home and couldn't pay off her debt. He scared the crap out of her just sitting there. He said, I'm not going to hurt you. Then he said, tell me about it. When did it start? How and why? So Maria told him. She cried and cried. She told him how sorry she was, how ashamed she was, how much she loved him. And she told him about the first time, about what Kenny did, and how it continued. How she tried to stay away from Kenny, but to no avail. When she finished, they just sat there, he was looking straight at her. There was no expression on his face, and she was crying. After about ten minutes, he got up and left. Without saying a word, he simply left. That was the last time she saw him. There was more silence, and then he turned in his seat and looked directly at me for the first time since he began his story. So what about the moral of the story? I'd like to know what you think. Here are your choices. Don't be a drunkard. Heredity outweighs everything else. You can't trust anyone, not even your family members. Endurance is very important. I looked at him again, thinking about it. Finally, I said, I think they all fit pretty well, but I think I'd like to offer another option. Don't break the pig rule. He looked interested. Pig rule? Tell me about it. This friend's cousin works in Washington, D.C. He is a lawyer and deals with politicians and other lawyers all the time. Corruption is everywhere, he says, but mostly it is minor. The guy takes his mistress with him to the government. Say, an all-expenses-paid trip so he can be with her at a luxury hotel in London. Or someone's wife uses his car with a license plate so she doesn't have to pay for parking. Or a congressman takes a couple thousand dollars and co-sponsors a bill he doesn't actually support. The thing is, it's all theft, but it's minor stuff. Everyone knows this is happening and no one cares. But when you behave like a pig, when you become greedy, then you have problems. Or the CEO throws himself a dollar four million birthday party on a Greek island, and the press finds out about it, and pretty soon he becomes a former CEO. So the moral is, if you're going to cheat, keep cheating, but don't be a pig. I think it fits your story. If Kenny hadn't become greedy, if he had been content to be with Maria once in a while instead of every day, her poor fool of a husband might never have found out about it and they could all have lived happily ever after. He said in a level voice, Do you think her husband was a poor fool? I laughed. No offense, believe me, I myself was one of them. My first wife cheated with another guy for almost five months before I found out I thought she was the most perfect, most loving wife a guy could ever have. So yeah, he was a poor fool. But there are many of us there, we sat in silence for some time, each thinking about our own things. He then slid off the stool and stood up to leave. Thanks for the story, I said. Unpleasant, but he held my attention better than most. Well, you offered me a new moral for that, so I thank you for that, he replied. He smiled briefly at me and headed down the corridor. I sat there for a few more minutes to finish my beer thinking about his history and nothing in particular. When I stood up to leave, I saw that he had left his briefcase on the floor, leaning against the counter. I bent down to pick it up, deciding I'd leave it to the bartender. Out of pure curiosity, 
I opened it and found that his business card was attached to one of the inner flaps. It read, Malcolm Alexander Summers, CPA, Williams and Donaldson, Houston, Texas. I shook my head, wondering how I could have missed this all this time. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. Listening to the next one. Listening.